Thank you very much, Inga. It's a great pleasure to be here and to follow after several talks and to begin to feel the, the waves of connection washing back and forth. Um, I hope that the volume that publishes all these talks will have an index because we definitely are cross-referencing one another uh, quite a bit. I'm going to talk with you today about Charles Lang Freer's collecting of ceramics, of specifically Chinese, Japanese, and Korean ceramics. And I'd like to start with a, a sort of preamble or a prologue um, to uh, reference the way in which my job at the Freer Gallery for the last 30 years has been to review the collections, uh, much of which Charles Freer acquired more than 100 years ago now, and update the ideas, the IDs for these ceramics um, based on what we now know, uh, thanks to archeology, span collecting history, and so forth. Much has changed since Freer was um, striding bravely into the field of ceramics collecting 100 years ago and more. Uh, so I began my work at the Freer by a fairly systematic review of the collection, uh, looking at each object, thinking about what it was called at the time and thinking about what I might want to call it. And one day I came upon this bowl, um, this funny, lumpy little bowl um, made with wonderful shigaraki clay, but clearly made by an amateur, as both the front view and the base view show. Um, now, this issue of ceramics made by amateur potters is a deeply interesting one, and this bowl appealed to me for that reason. I was glad to see it in the collection, but at the same time, I was asking myself, why on earth did Freer buy this bowl? And I found myself asking about this bowl and about many other pieces in the collection with the greatest respect. What was this man thinking? Why was he buying the pieces that he bought? Um, and last year, just last year, thanks to my colleague Lee Glazer, um, I had a, a revelation of sorts about what he was thinking and why he bought what he bought, including the little bowl that he had described with great delight as having fine autumnal tones. Let me go back to the autumnal tones of that bowl. Um, and to mention that the reason we know these things is that one of the traditions of record keeping that Freer established was to create um, individual records for each of the objects in his collection in which he wrote down his own comments and then on in which uh, comments of successive visitors have been recorded. So we know quite a bit about the exact words that Freer used to describe pieces that were of interest to him. Now, Freer, who was born in 1854 and died in 1919, is known for having established the Freer Gallery on the Mall um, as part of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. And his collection is known to have a rich variety of objects from much of Asia, from, Byzantine, uh, um, from Byzantium to um, Japan, as well as a wonderful collection of very um, narrowly focused American painting from the late 19th century. I want to focus more precisely today on Freer's collection, collecting of ceramics from Asia, and particularly from China, Korea, and Japan, since that is the field I'm responsible with, for within the gallery. Moreover, I'd like to look at this collecting not as a finished act, which is how we see it now, but as a process, and moreover, as a process that changed over time, as Freer himself changed. We're greatly helped in this kind of process by the modern electronic databases we have. This is a page from the Freer's database. 
And fortunately, since the Freer objects are accessioned by the year that Freer purchased them, we can flip through the database and really follow the unfolding of his taste year by year. And as I mentioned, we can also record, we can read what Freer had to say about his objects, as well as what scholars that he consulted had to say, and what scholars and viewers since then have said. Moreover, the database makes it quite possible to graph Freer's collecting of his Asian ceramics, beginning in 1892, with, as you can see, just a few tentative acquisitions, and burgeoning in several places uh, to well over 100 pots a year, until 1919, the year of his death. He was acquiring ceramics up until the last few months of his life. Um, moreover, it's important to remember that these are the final numbers of the ceramics that he passed as acceptable once he started culling his collection to make a museum collection rather than a private collection. Many other pieces that he acquired were uh, given away to friends or to um, the art museums of private colleges such as Smith and Amherst and Williams. But Another dimension of, of the record keeping is a very important dimension for understanding Freer's collection. Freer, whom you see here with his business partner, Colonel Hecker, was a businessman. In the years following the uh, Civil War, he entered into the business of railroads, quite a good choice to make. And he was another one of those self-made men that we've heard mentioned already by Mike. Um, in 1880, Freer and Hecker moved to Detroit and realized that the great growth of railroads cried out for companies to make railroad cars, and that's what they started doing. In 1885, they founded the Peninsula Car Company, which merged in 1892 to become the Michigan Peninsula Car Company, which uh, at that time was the largest manufacturer in the state before the days of automobile manufacturing. In 1899, then, the, that company merged to form the American Car and Foundry, which I was amazed to find, thanks to Wikipedia, still exists um, and is still making railroad cars and other things. But in that same year, uh, Freer retired, having become very wealthy. He was 45 years old. He was rather stressed by this activity of constant merger arrangement. And in a photograph that was taken just about that time, we see him preparing to leave his active career as a businessman and devote his, the rest of his life to his collecting. But Freer as a bookkeeper in his early days, um, gave us a wonderful tendency that he preserved in his own collecting to save every scrap of paper. His invoices, his receipts, his correspondence are all now in the archive of the Freer Gallery and are a wonderful resource for studying how this, collecting, uh, how this collection came to be formed. And indeed, I invite you to come and take a look if you are interested. Here you see uh, an invoice for Freer's acquisitions of Japanese prints from the dealer Yamanaka in 1895, early on in his collecting history. But as a prosperous young businessman in Detroit, Freer's collecting started out very closely connected to his uh, domestic activities. He built himself this house on Ferry Street, right close to the Detroit Institute of Art. Um, between the years 1890 and 1892, just as he was merging one business into another. And in the very early years of collecting art, he was collecting uh, with very much consideration of furnishing his house. For example, uh, the American painter uh, Tryon, Dwight William Tryon, painted for Freer these two paintings called Dawn and Winter in 1893 to be hung on opposite sides of a double fireplace in his reception room in his house. So he was looking at art as a very personal 
uh, material with which to surround himself in his private setting. And he began collecting Asian art with very much the same feeling. Uh, the early records of invoices of his purchase from dealers in New York um, show that he bought Japanese ceramics to use at home and also to uh, give away to friends and colleagues, business colleagues. For example, this dish, which he bought in 1894, a, a vaguely Kenzan-style dish, uh, at least it has a Kenzan mark on the bottom, um, Freer notes that he bought to put in the hallway to collect calling cards from visitors. But the most influential of the American painters with, it, with whom Freer interacted in developing his skills as a collector and his patronage as, as a collector was James McNeil Whistler. See him on the left in a portrait by a French artist. And uh, the painting on the right of variations in flesh color and green, the balcony, was the first large oil painting that Freer bought from Whistler in 1892 after buying many, many uh, etchings prior to that as he was just starting out. And it was Freer's personal interaction with Whistler and Whistler's deep interest in Asia as seen through the lens of Japonisme uh, as it was um, active in London in uh, the 1870s, 1880s, um, or 1860s, um, that eventually encouraged Freer to do what Whistler could not do, to go to Asia himself. And here you see the young Freer, aged 41, in Kyoto in 1895, having uh, gone by boat from London um, all the way to um, various stops in Asia before finally reaching Japan. And I think there's a feeling of adventure here that I want to preserve and come back to when we talk a bit more about Freer's collecting career. But as the influence, as the impact of being in Asia itself, of experiencing the cultures of cities like Kyoto, uh, Freer's collecting, his approach to collecting ceramics definitely started to change. Uh, this white Satsuma bottle, which Freer acquired in 1892, one of his earliest pieces, in fact, um, he described as having a Whistlerian landscape in blackish blue underglaze. His making drawing of connections to Whistler's etching, and on the right you see an etching from 1879 to 80 by Whistler called Venice, which Freer had bought in 1887. Um, his, in these comments, he made his connection to Whistler's artwork, which would be a recurring theme in his collecting of Asian art. And he also commented on the color of the decoration, this blackish blue underglaze. Both of these are important points in the development of Freer's eye for ceramics. If we look again at this chart, we see um, several spikes in the collecting process. One occurs in 1898 when, after rather cautious purchases, Freer suddenly really let go and bought a lot of ceramics, mostly from Yamanaka. Uh, again in 1901, Freer was buying um, Japanese and Korean ceramics. And finally in 1907, Freer was buying mainly Korean and Chinese ceramics. Indeed, as I'd like to point out, his collecting of these Asian ceramics from uh, China, Japan, and Korea developed in three rather distinct phases. He started with Japan. And I'm picking out for each of these um, country examples pieces that we currently consider to be important parts of our collection. Um, I would love to show you all the other complicated, complicating objects that Freer bought at the same time that call into great question our own definition of what great Asian ceramics are versus what 
was thought in Freer's day, but there's just not enough time to do that. So for Japan, we have standing in a, a Kenzan dish on the left and a tea bowl by the 17th century um, multi-talented um, man, uh, Honami Koetsu, whose painting Freer also co uh, collected with great passion. And it's particularly interesting that if the Satsuma bottle with that bluish black Whistlerian landscape was typical of the taste of the late 19th century for Japanese ceramics, it's quite remarkable that so many of Freer's purchases still agree or rather agree with what today we have come to consider to be important kinds of Japanese ceramics. Both of these pieces were bought in 1898 from the dealer Yamanaka, a Iga vase on the left and an early 17, of the late early 17th century and an early 17th century Karatsu ewer on the right. Now the second phase of Freer's collecting turned, began to turn to Korea. His Korean collecting started in the 1890s with his acquisitions of tea bowls coming out of Japanese collections. In uh, 1907, he made a very important large purchase of Koryo period Celadon, uh, representing the production of an earlier phase of Korean ceramics. And from that point onward until the end of his collecting career, he was focused on earlier um, Korean uh, ceramics, particularly Celadon. Finally, uh, it was only about 1905 that Freer turned seriously to collecting Chinese ceramics, even though he had b begun in 1894 and made a few purchases from time to time over the intervening years. We see here um, a Junware jar bought in 1907, a guanware jar bought in 1911, but on the right, another dimension of Freer's taste in Chinese ceramics, this Han jar bought in 1905, particularly because the glaze was so beautifully decayed as the result of its having been buried in a tomb. And this dedication to surface was something that Freer was um, constantly pursuing, um, not simply in the bowl with the beautiful autumnal tones, but here in the jar with the decayed copper green glaze. Another dimension of Freer's Chinese ceramic collection was an ongoing hunt for Sung ceramics. Even though at that time in collecting history, it was very difficult for anyone to say what Sung ceramics really were. And from the present day view, Freer ended up with quite a number of um, Ming and Qing ceramics in the style of Sung, um, but he was, he was trying hard. Another way of looking at this long traje trajectory of Freer's collecting, however, is to see that it divides very sharply in half. And that division occurs roughly in the year 1904. And the cause of it is the realization of the idea of the Freer Gallery. This was the year that the Smithsonian Institution accepted Freer's offer of his collection and his offer to build a museum on the mall and to provide funds to offer, operate it along with his collection. So as I've looked um, quite carefully and repeatedly at Freer's ceramic collecting patterns in preparing for this talk, it really has come to feel to me that there are two Freers who are collecting. There's the Freer, and I'll show you both of them. There's the Freer of the 1890s uh, prior to 1904, who is the somewhat carefree and enthralled private collector who writes about his pieces that they are splendid or fine or good or that they have bluish black pigment. Um, he's writing about the color. He's writing about the autumnal tones. He's reveling in the appearance of his ceramics. 
And then there's the freer of the museum building um, prominent businessman, seen here in, on the right in 1907 back in Japan, in a very different, I think you'll agree, very different um, mood. He's now surrounded by people who are carefully looking after his every need, and he feels rather confident about what he's doing. Um, he's now very serious about what he's doing. But I want to turn back then to talk about a bit more about the, the young Freer as an, a kind of experimental collector, uh, the Freer whose interests focused not simply on his American paintings, but on the Asian ceramics he collected in what my colleague Lee Glazer has um, quoted him as emphasizing a, a quality of surface beauty, quality of color, texture, um, that he saw as being not uh, confined to any given culture, but a sort of universal quality that he found in the works of art from both Asia and America, particularly Whistler, that appealed to him. Here is Freer in 1909 looking at a 1903 Whistler painting called Venus Rising from the Sea and an early Islamic jar that he had bought in 1905. And he's consciously placed them together, giving us a message about what he saw was important. And it's in this way of looking that this little bowl with its fine autumnal tones acquires a kind of explanation for Freer's taste, just as for these other early acquisitions of Japanese ceramics. Uh, the, the much stained and discolored Satsuma jar on the left, which Freer recorded as being splendid, and the Takatori ware 17th century tea bowl on the right, which Freer bought in 1897 and said was a very beautiful specimen, fine and unusual. But once Freer became the proprietor of a museum to be, all of this spontaneous enjoyment seems to disappear, at least to disappear from the records he kept. Um, the records take on an earnestness, a kind of seriousness, um, that reflect not only his own changing sense of his responsibility, but a changes in the times as archaeology began to reveal the true nature of the history of Asian ceramics, as exhibitions such as the 1910 Burlington Fine Arts Club exhibition in London revealed early Chinese pottery and porcelain, or the 1914 Japan Society New York exhibition revealed China, Korea, and Japanese ceramics. Or, and books began to be written, including those by Hobson, the British Museum curator in 1915 on Chinese pottery and porcelain. And in 1921, the Oriental Ceramic Society in London would be formed to pursue very seriously these questions of just what was what. So here I show you um, notes that Freer kept about this little um, covered jar, which he bought in 1898 out of the Dana collection, a collection formed by a painter. Um, at the time, it was thought to be Sung, but it's now thought to be a Jingdezhen piece of the 18th or 19th century. And it's very interesting that that's exactly what Freer said it was at the beginning. Although in consultation with Mr. Hobson, um, who was just writing his book at the moment that Freer was talking with him, and who was a curator for the Japan Society exhibition, um, there were much more serious issues con considered about what this jar might be. And rather than responding in a more generalized emotional way to the quality of the glaze of this jar, certainly the way he had responded when he bought it in 1898, Freer was dealing with these very art historical kinds of issues of little spots of red glaze and so forth. Um, another piece, um, a Japanese bowl by the uh, early, seven, early 18th century um, entrepreneur Kenzan uh, reveals a similar kind of tone. Rather than talking about the tonalities 
of the cream colored um, body and the grays and blues of the painting, Freer is now worrying about the brush strokes. He really is starting to talk, I'm sorry to say, like an art historian. <laughs> but I told you that I had a revelation and it has to do with another event that occurred in Freer's life, collecting life, just before the Smithsonian accepted his collection. In 1903, Freer had bought a Whistler painting called The Princess from the Land of Porcelain that, Whist uh, that Fr Whistler had painted in 1863 and 1864 and that had hung in this room as you see it. And in 1904, the room came up for sale and Freer bought this room. Now this is the room known as Harmony in Blue and Gold or the Peacock Room. And many of you are probably familiar with the story of how this room had started looking quite different when it was the dining room of a London-based collector of Chinese porcelain named Frederick Leyland, who used it to display his blue and white porcelain. And you may know the story of how Free, uh, Whistler came in and disapproved of the original color scheme and asked Leyland whether he couldn't touch up the room a bit to uh, complement the colors of his painting um, hanging in the room. And Leyland said yes, left uh, London for business elsewhere, and returned to find that Whistler had completely repainted the room in these shades, which I'll show you again, of blue and green and gold. To, and um, they did indeed complement Leyland's blue and white Chinese porcelain as well. But once Freer bought the Peacock Room, he had it shipped to him in Detroit, and he installed it in a new special room in his carriage house, and he, um, moreover, put his own pots on the shelves of the room. By 1908, um, he had well over 1,100 pots to play with, and up they went on the shelves. And he was interested enough in the results that he had black and white photographs taken. I had looked at these black and white photographs but never gave them a lot of thought. I thought that it looked odd to see Chinese pots in the, of the Han Dynasty in the Peacock Room and simply assumed that Freer was using the shelves as a kind of extra storage space, but I, I should have known better. And indeed, the revelation came last year when my colleague Lee Glazer uh, went to the trouble of identifying all of these um, pots represented only in the black and white photograph, figuring out which was which, and putting them back on the shelves of the peacock room. So this is what we see now. And the revelation, to me at least, was that the young Freer, in a kind of culmination of his early phase of collecting when he was collecting with his emotions and collecting with his eyes that had been trained on American colorist painting, was painting in the peacock room with his pots. He was responding to the color harmonies that Whistler had started to set up, and he was, in a sense, completing the peacock room by adding his own color harmonies through the addition of his uh, pottery. And we can even see that that collecting spike of Chinese ceramics in 1907 had included a great number of Junware or Jun style ware pale blue glazes. And I now believe that Freer was already planning this installation and gathering pieces of light colors to put on the shelves at one end of the room underneath the peacocks. Whereas in other co uh, corners of the room, he was assembling the bright turquoise glazes of early Islamic pottery or the dull gray greens of Korean celadon or the copper greens of Han um, tomb pottery 
or indeed those little bottles with bluish black underglaze painting. So it was this uh, gesture that Freer made that in a way finally explained to me what he was thinking when he looked at that little red bowl and described it as having fine autumnal coloration. He was looking at the surface beauty of the pots that he acquired, just as he saw that in his paintings. He was looking for a kind of universality in this surface beauty, the way in which different colors spoke to one another regardless of where they'd been made or when. And he even included um, some fakes um, because the color was right. Um, and a Japanese colleague who saw the pictures of the peacock room recently wrote to me that she could think of very few examples where we know so personally what a collector was thinking as he acquired his collection or as he played with the collection once it was formed up to a certain point. And with all due respect to the later Freer and his very serious collecting for his museum, I now discover um, a great delight in the young Freer and his untrammeled private collecting of ceramics for his own enjoyment. Thank you. Thank you.